Well, hello, everyone. Today, I am talking to the author of one of this year's best-selling books here at Masterbooks. The book, Traced, Human DNA's Big Surprise, gives us scientific evidence that helps us defend the authority of the Bible, the age of the earth, the origin of life, the unbiblical issue of racism, and more. You are going to love hearing from Dr. Jensen, who is both a man of science and a man of God. We're talking about his research and how you can use this evidence in his book in your discussions with skeptics and unbelievers. Also, I'm offering a very special discount on this book for our podcast listeners. So check out the show notes for the coupon and the details. Welcome to the Master Books Podcast, where we bring you conversations that will strengthen your biblical worldview and the faith of your family. I'm Jennifer White publicist at Master Books, a division of New Leaf Publishing Group. As host of this show, I'll be opening the doors to the Master Books family library of books, authors, and curriculum. For over 45 years, our company has been about one thing, ink on paper to touch eternity. In a world increasingly at war with God, we are publishing to partner with you to disciple your family, the church, and the nations. All right. So Dr. Jensen, welcome to the Master Books podcast. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's great to get to talk to you, not in person, but at least face to face. We've been doing a lot of talking this year since your book came out. And it's been a joy to see how people have received your book. And I'm excited to tell our friends that listen to the podcast or watch it um, about your book. So tell us a little bit about yourself, about your research and how this book came to be. Yes, I'll make a long story very short. I grew okay. up in a Christian home, was homeschooled through eighth grade, went to a small Christian high school just because this was early stages of homeschooling. So we didn't know if colleges would accept a homeschool diploma. Times, of course, have changed. Mm -hmm. I went to a secular undergraduate institution and then to Harvard for my PhD. So that the undergraduate was just a small branch of the University of Wisconsin system. Mm -hmm. It was close so I could commute from home, which the one semester I spent on campus and uh, Got a little taste of the depravity that was, I say modern, I'm, I'm going to say modern college campuses, but now, now that's eons ago. It was 2000, 2003 is when I graduated undergraduate and things have changed even more since then. But I was grateful to have been at home, have a, had a strong home church. And then I joined the Institute for Creation Research in 2009, was there mm -hmm. about five and a half, six years, joined Answers in Genesis 2015. So in total, about 13 years of professional creation science research. And this book really is the fruit of all of those 13 years and applied lessons from graduate school and undergraduate, uh, this new book, Traced, I should say, and uh, but especially of research that I've done along with other colleagues in the last five years rather intensely. Okay. Well, I'm so amazed always to and, and thrilled to work for a company that publishes information that is so scientifically researched, so backed up by research. And I love that you have this degree from Harvard and your love for God, that you have brought together the, the gifts of God to benefit um, those of us who are fulfilling the mission that God's given us. So tell us a little bit about Trace, Human DNA's Big Surprise. What is the big surprise? The big surprise is a generation by generation family tree for global humanity that might sound a little bit arcane or or abstract basically what we have now is the answer to the history of the peoples of this planet so who do i come from not just in a who's my grandfather but which people group do i come from which people group did they come from and you can take the chain all the way back now to Noah and his sons wow and this gives us something i never had when i was a student just because we didn't have this technology nor these answers. And I should say these answers are explicitly grounded in the biblical time scale, the biblical framework, not just because we have to do it that way to fulfill some sort of, you know, check some sort of box, mm -hmm. but because it, we're, we're now at the stage of creation science research, we're now at the stage of history, you could say, history of science, where the Bible is an essential framework for doing science. You won't find these answers confirmation of what we do know already from history, discovery of new things we didn't know before. You, you don't get any of that unless you have the biblical framework. The mainstream community is missing this because of their commitment 
to evolution. So this is a really revolutionary step forward, not just for Answers in Genesis, but for the creation science community as a whole. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that um, people are receiving this so well. We're on our third printing of this book, and it's so wonderful to have this biblical framework to be able to present. People are so interested in ancestry, right? I mean, the ancestry.com and all the other things people want to know. But like you said, if we take this all the way back to the biblical genealogies, how fascinating and how eager will we be able to be in this conversations we're having with skeptics who have believed what uh, mainstream science has told them? I'm so thankful that we have this framework for explaining how we know the Bible is true. Ken Ham has talked about this book being the Rosetta Stone of human history. Why does he say that? Let me answer that question with a specific thought towards a couple different groups of people. Okay. One is think of homeschool moms. So I, I'm married with four kids. We're homeschooling three of them, okay. uh, ages nine, eight, and six. Uh, number four is just four years old and spunky and pretends he does school too. But uh, <laughs> so we're, we're in the throes of thinking about these things. What this book does for a homeschool parent, let's say, mm -hmm. this gives you information that has not yet made it into textbooks. This isn't simply a rehash or attempt to resynthesize what's out there. This is new groundbreaking research. Mm -hmm that hasn't been published anywhere before, hasn't been discovered anywhere before. There's there's new elements of history, and we'll probably get into this, pre-Columbian history, for example, that no one else on earth knew before. Actually, I should back up a second. The indigenous peoples themselves have written about this, and there's a whole other aspect of this project where, in a sense, the, the biblical framework is, is giving indigenous communities their history back that mainstream science has taken away from them which is a path I never thought we'd ever go down, but here we are mm -hmm. because we're, we're making we're making discoveries again about going back to that, that main point application for homeschooling parents. Here is information that you won't find in any curriculum because it's just that fresh, that new. And again, it's not because we happen to go digging around in some dusty old history book and say, hey, look, let's add this to our curriculum. It's I'm doing, we're doing original research, genetic research that no one else has done that's why it's so new. So here's, in a sense, here's a preview for what's going to eventually make it into textbooks, because mm. we're at now. We're now in a phase of creation science. We're now in a phase of the origins debate, where creation scientists aren't just pushing back on evolution, which we've done a lot of, and that's laid a tremendous uh, foundation for mm -hmm. what we're able to do now. But we're now we've now advanced to a next phase where creation and science are actively making new discoveries about the world. It's not just defense; we're playing offense. So yes. now we're positioned where we can do this. I even have to keep reminding myself of where this all fits in the big picture, mm -hmm. just because it is new. It's a newer way of thinking, especially for folks who've been around for a while and witnessed the creation evolution debate, been in the throes of it, been thinking about education from a creationist perspective. This, mm -hmm. this, is, this is a game changer. So in that sense, that's one element why I think we can rightfully call it a, a Rosetta Stone of human history because it represents a new phase of creation science where it's not just defense, it's 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 we've pushed back against evolution. And now that we've set that framework and we have a biblical foundation, we can take that foundation and take it forward to say, let's make some discoveries about the world, which is what this book shows. Here's a summary of research that's happened in an accessible way. Uh, I think of other books that are out there that perhaps we really haven't much of an analogy for in Christendom and mm -hmm. evangelical publishing, just because creation science haven't scientists haven't been positioned in this way before. Popular histories that are out there that you find at Barnes and Noble and such. That's what this book does. It takes you through the latest research. Some of the books, I guess, the, the World I Swim in 1491, who we are and, and, and how we got here. A book by David Reich, a, a, a prominent guy at Harvard. So here's the latest research that we're doing that's not yet in textbooks. That's kind of what this book is, yet it's all creation science. So that's, yes. that's to me one of the most exciting elements of this. That's, I guess, how I think about it as a homeschool parent. Mm -hmm. How does this apply to what my nine-year-old is going to learn in history class this year? Well, there's some things that haven't yet made it into the textbooks. By the way, here's a heads up. Here's what's coming. Right. So education for parents as well. And then there's the whole, whatever educational mode someone chooses, whatever stage of life they're at. Maybe they're a single person. Mm -hmm. Don't even have kids. Not even thinking about homeschooling. They're, they're grandparents beyond homeschooling. This book also has, as, as we've mentioned, this profound application to every person individually to answer the question, who do I come from? In this mm -hmm. case, I'm using the, the male inherited DNA, the Y chromosome, 
So it's who does my paternal line come from? It doesn't leave the ladies out. The guys have the same question that they have to re wrestle with because I've taken my Y chromosome test, for example. I know my my dad's line, but what about my mother's side? So we had my mother's brother get a Y chromosome test. Anyway, everyone's involved in this. It applies to every single person. There's new answers now to this long-standing question of how do I connect to the people listed in scripture? Wow. I'm thrilled for Master Books and for you and for the community that we are a part of this groundbreaking research and releasing it um, into the world. And how exciting to have what's not in the textbooks yet, but to also just have this offensive position of the Bible can be trusted. Here's even more evidence that you haven't seen before. So I'm excited for the homeschool families as well as the Christian apologists and those who love to um, help the world see the realities of the biblical authority. So tell us about the recent origins of the earth. I know that that has been, and like you mentioned, the pushback for evolution, we've been on the defensive. So how does this impact what I can say to someone about how old the earth is and their ideas of it? And, and let me expand that question, make it even more all-encompassing and and, and and set the larger historical framework. This is fresh in my mind because I'm, I'm giving a talk to a group in about a week and a half on this topic. Okay. So, the, so in my mind, what comes to mind here is we've got a, we've got a mainstream community by, by surveys, 99% of PhDs hold to evolution, reject this concept that the earth is 6,000 years old, reject the recent origin of humanity, and in recent years, reject the entire concept of Adam and Eve. They'll explicitly deny that now with genetics. So what's a Christian? What's a creationist to do? What's a Christian parent to do? Anyone who's interested in science, how do you change that? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a weighty group of people with massive amounts of money. The NIH budget, the NSF budgets combined are over $50 billion annually. And just to put that in perspective, I think of our generous donor base, if someone gave a million dollars to genetics research, that would be a tremendous gift. We'd hoop and holler. Mm -hmm. And that would represent two one thousandths of 1% of the annual budget of the NIH and NSF. So okay. that's what creation scientists are up against mm -hmm. when they're trying to push back against the view that's taught in school. And so, so then on top of that, when you think about this bigger picture, I, what I like to say is the mainstream community basically has a suffocating monopoly on science education. So when we're talking about pushback, we're talking about pushing back against a behemoth of massively funded hundreds of thousands of people and a court system that's ruled out. You can't teach creation science in the public schools. You can't fund it. You can't publish papers on it. Everything about creation science has been marginalized and pushed to the fringes. Mm -hmm. So here someone stands up and says, you know, the earth is 6,000 years old. What? What do you do against all that? What's exciting to me, so I'll, I'll say the conclusion and I'll tell you how I got there. Creationists have already won the war. It's hard to believe that. When you think about we're $50 billion behind the eight ball, <laughs> that much to combat. Hundreds of thousands of scientists, almost all of them agreeing with evolution. In exclusion of everything creation science from the mainstream education system, from kindergarten to PhD and beyond, you'll get canceled if you're publicly a creation scientist. Never get hired at the University of Chicago or anywhere else okay. if you're a creationist. So what what do you do? What makes it what makes it so exciting, why I say creationists have won the war, is if, if you look at what these people have said specifically about why they've excluded creation science from instruction, why they've excluded creation science in 6,000 years from funding, why they've excluded creation science from the mainstream discussion in the peer-reviewed journals, what they basically say is creation science is religion. The whole concept of creation science, they would say, is this religious, anti-scientific approach to knowing the world. We've got this holy book. It cannot be questioned. And we fit all facts to this written document. That's what they say. Mm -hmm. And they say science is the opposite. Science is basically synonymous with skepticism. There's nothing sacred. There's nothing we can't question. There's no holy book that can't be questioned. Uh, to almost quote one of these famous anti-creationists, uh, science looks for chinks in the established armor of the framework. That's just how science does. That's what scientists pride themselves on. In a nutshell, 
the phrase that's worked its way into court decisions and into mm -hmm. books against creation science, what they've said is creation science doesn't make testable predictions. So what would be the a manifestation of saying there's things you can't question? Well, we're not going to make predictions that you could potentially prove false because that would, you know, that would threaten what we hold to. That's how they view creation science. Testable predictions. I would say, uh, thinking about the origin of humanity, one of the things, just use an example from the book then, traced, one of the predictions of creation science would be if humanity goes back to Noah, if the entire civilization of the globe was wiped out in a flood 4,500 years ago, and then restarts with eight people, Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives, then the entire history of civilization, Egypt, Sumer, Rome, Greece, all that, Mm -hmm. will be stamped all over our DNA. You get a very different expectation for evolution because they stretch out the history of humanity over hundreds of thousands of years. Okay. So there, there's a testable prediction. Do we see it or don't we? It, you know, it's kind of a, a dangerous thing to do because now there's some uncertainty you've introduced here to this, this biblical model mm -hmm. in a sense. My point is creation scientists have now published testable predictions. They've met the standard of science that evolutionists have demanded and gone beyond it. These predictions are actually working. That's what makes to me this this book so exciting is it's creation science that's working. It's now this, we're, we're in a new phase. We're going beyond just playing defense. We're, we're playing offense. That's, that's, that's my long winded first answer to how to, how do you equip people to defend 6,000 years? Mm -hmm. We are now meeting the gold standard of science. All these, all these things that evolutionists have accused us over the years, we've empirically disproved. We're doing exactly the science that they told us we should be doing and that science just so happens to confirm 6,000 years. You do see the history of humanity stamped all over our DNA. This book, even though it's primarily a history book, is essentially one long apologetic argument saying it's all there. All that, all those evidences we should see in our DNA, boom, they pop out. If you have the 4,500-year timescale, I'm not the hero of this story. The biblical timescale is it's an explicitly young earth book that shows the young earth timescale is the winner, the hero of the story. And that's just one element. That's that's one thing I'd tell someone if they say, how do I defend this? I'd say roles have been completely reversed. Creation okay. scientists are now are now making testable predictions. They're doing exactly the science that evolutionists have said. Now, here's where, here's where you can't make stuff up and where the evolutionary community has has gifted creation science a tremendous asset. So you, you can't plan this. You can't ask for this. It just, you watch it happen and say, thank you. So there's been three, three or so major responses to this book since it came out in March of this year, PhD evolutionists at universities in different spots in the country. What do you think their response might be? So here, here I've now proposed these testable hypotheses. I've in a sense mm -hmm. given them rope by which to hang my ideas. You'd think okay. the evolutionists would be excited and embrace all this. We're going to disprove creation science once and for all. Mm -hmm. They've done no such thing. Instead, what they've done essentially is say, this research that has been published, this book is wrong because it disagrees with the evolutionary textbook. In other words, we have a book that you can't question. <laughs> we have a holy book whose literal interpretation guides what we do. And anyone who disagrees with it must therefore be wrong. I thought, I can't believe you're saying this. <laughs> You're embodying exactly what you've accused creation scientists of doing for 40 years. You're right. openly, without apology, doing religion in the name of science <laughs> and erecting a body of work that apparently is, is, is untouchable. So, wow, this is a complete role reversal. Not only have creation scientists said, no, we, we can and we have, we do make testable predictions. And, and this is just the beginning, really. Mm -hmm. If you read the book, you'll see this is just the tip of the iceberg of a whole bunch of research that's still coming from this. We're just beginning to unravel the history of the peoples of this planet. There's a lot of research going forward. Creation scientists are, 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 are asking questions, answering, doing science. And now the evolutionists have come full circle and they're doing religion by their own admission, by mm -hmm. their own standards out there in public and I, I, you know, that, that's the part I just, I can't believe. I mean, it's right in front of me, so I can believe it. But I just, I thought, I mean, okay, you went that direction. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. It's, it clarifies the issue. It's a great <laughs> gift to anyone who wants to defend creation science. Mm -hmm. They're doing religion by their mm -hmm. own standards. That's their answer to the new evidence that's been advanced. And the only thing, again, like I can say is, thank you, evolutionary community. I appreciate the clarification. It really helps our cause going forward and makes it a lot mm -hmm. easier to to 
advance the point I'm trying to make. Right. It makes me so joyful to think about what has been accomplished with your research and how, and the reaction to it is fascinating. You would think we would be having these big debates. They'd be challenging you to these enormous televised debates. And yet so far that's not really happening yet. Yes, their approach, one of them in particular had written a blog post several years ago called In Defense of Ridicule, something along those lines where he said, and this is, I think, is typical of the general attitude right now in mainstream science. He said, creation science has so been disproved for so long. Mm -hmm. There's no point trying to debate it anymore. We should just make fun of it. And his added, Herman Mays is the guy's name. He's a PhD at Marshall University, West Virginia. In his public interactions, he practices what he preaches. He has a very condescending, rather, I think, obnoxious attitude towards anyone who disagrees with them, even fellow evolutionists. Some of them have to say, settle down. I mean, the, the, you know, we're your allies. You don't need to be so belligerent mm -hmm. towards us. Mm -hmm. But he, he that's what he said he was going to do, and he does it. So there's another, in a sense, gift to the creation science community. They've said in print now, we've given up on rational discussion. We're just going to try to make fun of you because Again, we think there's truths now that have been established and are no longer questionable. Mm. Okay, that seems to be the opposite of what you've defined science as for right. four decades, if not more. But if you want to go there, go right ahead. And, and that, that tees it up for creation scientists to, to step in where they've, they've, they've left off. Yeah. Well, I want to remind the listeners, in case um, you're just tuning in right now, that we have a special that we're offering on this book, Traced, Human DNA's Big Surprise by Dr. Jensen. And you'll find the details, the coupon code and the details in the show notes. One thing I don't want to miss in talking to you before our time runs out today is about how your research impacts this very divisive, very destructive issue of racism that we have seen for generations in America and I mean, anywhere in the world, but particularly we've seen a lot of trouble here. And so how, um, how will this be a tool to help resolve some of that? There's a couple things that come to mind, sort of short answers and then, and then long, slightly longer explanations. One is I'd say, perhaps it sounds like a truism, but this book illustrates this in a new way. None of us are who we think we are. Mm. Once you have DNA to uncover what is my paternal line, what are my multiple paternal lines through dad, through dad's mom, through mom's mm -hmm. mom, through mom's dad, that sort of thing, some really explosive answers begin to emerge. For example, most Europeans, light-skinned people like you and me, who think we go back to the Romans or the Greeks, that's our heritage, which in a sense, yes, that's true. But the dominant genetic lineages right now in Europe came from Central Asia in the Middle Ages, so that your ancestors, most likely, my ancestors, most likely, didn't look like me and you, but probably looked more Chinese than mm -hmm. anything else. So when I say Central Asia, I'm talking about what's now the former Soviet republics, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all those stans sort of between mm -hmm. uh, Eastern Europe and, and, and China, where, you, again, to this day, you still have people that have a much more East Asian appearance than they do European those were likely the ancestors of most Europeans. So most Europeans looked like that for thousands of years, not like the Romans and Greeks. Is there mm -hmm. still Roman and Greek ancestry in Europe? Yes, but it's a minority. So that's, that's one element. What blows this wide open though, is the sort of the rarer or the more nuanced and, and wild and woolly stories that emerge from genetics. So there are some Scandinavians, blonde haired, blue eyed, light skinned people, whose male ancestry goes back, if you go back perhaps a century, or excuse me, a millennium or so, back to Arab Muslim peoples who would have looked more olive-skinned, dark-haired. Mm -hmm. So there's a significant switch, not something you might expect. But the family tree doesn't stop there. There are Arab Muslims who go back. That same line takes you back to northeastern Africa to some of the dark-skinned Sudanese peoples, the Nubians. So there's something you'd even less likely to expect that you have right. blonde haired, tall Swedes coming from people who, who look like Manute Bowl or, you know, he's you know, very tall Sudanese looking uh, former NBA player, but yeah. people like that going back in the day. And the story doesn't stop there either. You have so, some of those Nubians sat on the throne of Egypt. So there are, there, there could be people who, who 
listen to this program who are of Scandinavian descent who have a legitimate genetic claim connection to the ancient throne of Egypt, to the pharaohs of Egypt that, again, who would have ever imagined that, yet here, here these new genetic tools reveal that. And another way to summarize this would be to say the so-called races of people have changed multiple times in human history. Okay. I just gave one example there where you go from light skin to olive skin to dark skin to Egypt. It, it just, you look at this and you say, no way. That's what I think when I, when I see this, mm -hmm. but it's true. It's genetically plausible. Genetic change, ethnic change can happen in the generational blink of an eye from light skin to dark skin and back and so forth. Wow. Th these are just a few examples of the multiplicity of discoveries that have emerged from all this. How can anyone claim racial superiority when their so-called race has had such a mixed up, jumbled up, nuanced, changing heritage? How can anyone claim, especially, you know, so what's often passed around or, or promoted in today's culture as examples of racism, white supremacy. Well, how can mm -hmm. anyone claim white supremacy when there's a 75% chance their ancestors were likely Chinese looking <laughs> and not the ancient Romans. So right. these are the sorts of things that, that blow that up. And I, what I like to think about is imagine every school child grew up learning this history where, I mean, I, I can't think of it in any way you could even attempt to make a rational case for racism. If you have a, a fixed, unchanging lineage going back to a certain peoples, maybe you can try to make it. I mean, it's still be wrong because the Bible mm -hmm. teaches us that's, that the world come from Noah. But to see it exploded in this way where there's there's almost constant racial or, or ethnic change, I feel like that would transform the thinking of so many students where, why, why would anyone go that direction? It's just, it's just stupid. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I'd like to think this is part of the application, part, part of the relevance of this book. It takes that issue and gives it a completely different spin once you know the history, the, the history of peoples and right. how complex it is. I don't see how, how the idea of racial superiority could ever enter anyone's consciousness in a rational way, because there's no way to make a, a rational case for it. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. And I want everybody to tell everybody about it. You know, I mean, why wouldn't we want to share this amazing truth that really just squashes what the world tells us is true about us? It's not, it's just fascinating. And what I want you to tell us now is, is this a readable book? You are a PhD from Harvard. This is a lot of scientific research. Can I read this book? Can the listener read this book and understand what you're saying? How have you um, created it so that we can digest it? Yeah. So I'd, I'd say in short, yes, this is very much designed to be a readable book. Let me actually bring up another one in case people have read some of my earlier books. Okay. One of the, one of the first major books I published is this book called Replacing Darwin. And the audience I had in mind here was, uh, mm -hmm. as this master books project as well, was a college student. This is the book I wish I had when I was in college and I had evolutionary classmates who thought, what do you mean you're a creation scientist? What do you, what do you talk about? Read this book, it'll change mm -hmm. your view or it'll at least challenge your presuppositions, 10 chapters of science. That does get into the weeds. Okay. I set that up as a contrast because this was deliberately designed to be less technical, much okay. more accessible. Both books I had lay people read through it. I mean, I had a, a pastor read through Replacing Darwin saying, please help me make sure this is understandable. And he mm -hmm. had some great points. I still think, think it's accessible. It's just, you do get into some very detailed genetics. This book, what do you need to know? And, the, and it teaches you. All you need to know is basically family trees. That's what this book discusses. DNA just so happens to be the tool, but that's all it is. This isn't designed to be a college level genetics book. It's Here's the story of peoples as we can read it off a family tree, mm -hmm. which just so happens to be based on DNA. There's opening chapters to, to lay the groundwork, just some of the basic principles to set people up for some of these shocks that the family tree reveals. But it's designed to be just for, for public consumption, anyone to read it. It's not going to be a simple read in the sense of it gets into some depth just because we're trying to tell the history of the planet. So I, right. I feel like you have to give a little bit more justification for what you're doing. And if you're going to make such an audacious claim, especially in today's culture where you, you read the book and then you talk to your neighbor and there's a good chance they say, you're nuts. I don't believe a word you're saying. That, that's fringe stuff. So you have to be able to give people a little bit more meat to be able to defend what they're saying. But this mm -hmm. is definitely designed to be accessible for anyone, any homeschool parent, 
any any average lay reader so that they can walk away and say, this is the history of peoples. They can use this book to, to understand their own history. I've got a table in here. If someone takes a genetic test, here's how you can line it up and find your own ancestry. Find which son of Noah you come from. Oh, wow. And I've also set up a, a portal. If you go to www.answersingenesis.org slash go, G-O, and then slash traced, the name of this book, it'll take you to a page. You scroll down, you can enter your name, email, and it'll go directly to my inbox. I've had several hundred people contact me this way, many of whom are saying, I've got a genetic test. Here's the result. It's Greek to me. And I can look it up in about 10 seconds and give them the answer and say, here's your history in, 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 in several lines. Here's the son of Noah that you come from. It's been a lot of fun to help people with this just because people get excited about it. I get excited about it. Yeah. We're doing research going forward. So if people want to participate in that research going forward, that's the same portal that you go to as well. Answersingenesis.org slash go slash traced. So uh, I'm looking forward to see what comes after this as well. This is this has mm -hmm. been, a, I think, an exciting start. I've been excited by the response we've gotten already. And I'm, I'm really excited about discoveries we're going to make going forward with with even more genetic data Absolutely. from this afterwards. Well, what a joy for us at Masterbooks to be a part of this groundbreaking research, being in the hands of other people. What a joy for me to be able to share it with all of our Masterbooks friends and family so that you can take this information and change your world with it. I mean, I, I'm just very excited about where this is going to go. The realities that we have now we can hold in our hand and point to the scientific evidence that shows that what you read in the Bible is legitimately true and to be able to defend our faith with people who have tried to squash our faith for so many generations. So thank you for what you've done, all that you've done to give us that, to put that in our hands. And again, I want to encourage you to find the link to order Traced Human DNA's Big Surprise by Dr. Jensen at masterbooks.com. That link's going to be in the show notes, along with how you can get it at a great discount with a coupon code that we'll have in the show notes as well. Dr. Jensen, thank you for taking your time to share with us about your research and your book. And friends, I just want to bless you. I want to bless you with just the opportunity to think about the fact that James 1.5 says that we can ask for wisdom from the Lord and get it liberally. And something, and we're talking today, listening today to Dr. Jensen, share with us liberal wisdom. This is a liberal gift of wisdom, not liberal in, this, in politics, but a generous gift of wisdom to help us defend our own faith, to share it with the generations that you are discipling and also with the world. So we thank you for being a part of and a partner with Master Books, who is publishing Ink on Paper to Impact Eternity. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next podcast. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for joining the Master Books podcast. This was fun, and we are really glad you were with us. We invite you to check out masterbooks.com. We have a big library of books that will feed the faith of your family. And hey, subscribe to our channel so you won't miss an episode. We'll see you next time.